So I'm going to whip through this case. Um, it's, it's pretty simple, all in all, for, in terms of its diagnostic point of view. But it's a, we were involved with a 28 year old male, married but has no kids, and he's a student at the Regent College, then be a pastor. And he began with a, a left testicular mass that had he'd noticed for the past month, and was seen at the Student Self Health Services at UBC, where they gave him a course of antibiotics. But at that time, he also arranged for a scrotal ultrasound. And um, so, so I don't know if you want to go quickly over the ultrasound. This was done at UBC <laughs> Hospital. Just a couple of um, images. Uh, this uh, transverse used to be last testicle here. It's very heterogeneous. It contains uh, extensive infiltrating abnormality here with several modular components. Uh, on color doctor imaging, there were uh, full size full within that. Most of it was uh, hypovascular. You see here, transfers used to the sort of showing the normal right test of, and the abnormal left. The, the abnormal left is a large nodular configuration on the surface. Quite echo poor, very abnormal. Right side is fine. That's just a summary. Yeah, so, so in, in summary, we've got uh, a very profusely ab abnormal left test, uh, which is infiltrated by a um, Predominantly echo poor is somewhat nodular process, and I think given the appearance here that this isn't uh, extremely hypervascular, the main concern would have to be a uh, testicular chronic tumor. Uh, differential chronic uh, or chitis can produce that appearance, uh, but it's quite unusual. The diagnosis would include uh, testicular primary. What about granuloma? As in granuloma that's or chitis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's sort of thing. Possible. Yeah, they've really been for a month, and it was um when this was reviewed by the urologist, he really didn't have much pain, and it, it uh, um, was just a focus of a, a nodule in the upper pole of the testis, but on the ultrasound, it looked like a diffuse hypoechoic uh, lesion. As Campbell says, any hypoechoic lesion within the tunica albuginea is markedly suspicious for testis cancer. And that's true, um, but I just wanted to show a couple of ultrasounds of testicles showing benign lesions just to quickly review some of these classic images. Does anyone know what this is? It's a classic, confined, what's that? Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, the, the thing that distinguishes it on ultrasound compared to the one our patient had is it's well circumscribed. It has no flow. It's a cyst really filled with desclamated, desclamated keratinizing material. And this can sometimes present as a pinpoint nodule on a, uh, that is somewhat painful under the tunica albuginea. And it, it's classic for a cyst, tunica albuginea cyst, uh, and looks, has simple cyst features on ultrasound. This can also be imaged with ultrasound. It presents with swelling and, and pain within the testicle. And it has no flow and represents tubular ectasia of the retae testis and may be associated with down obstruction. And uh, this is a more recently described finding. On ultrasound, it has increased flow with Valsalva. It's inside the testicle parenchyma and represents an intra-testicular varicocele. Um, and it may present with projection. Uh, oh. <laughs> or what? I missed that one. <laughs> and, and often those are not associated with a, a scrotal varicocele. So anyway. Back to our patient, he came, was referred to a local urologist, and on further history, he found out that he'd had a history of bilateral cryptorchidism. He also had bilateral orchiopexy at the age of four. Otherwise, he had normal puberty, no uh, other uh, symptoms, and no pr prior surgeries other than orchiopexy. On exam, he had normal secondary sexual characteristics, no evidence of metastatic disease. His right testis was normal, normal size and consistency. And the left test has demonstrated the nodule. He had a palpable vas deferens on both sides. His um, tumor markers were all within normal range. And so we sent him off to Genesis to spank his sperm, as he was going to have an orchiectomy for, uh, for presumed cancer. And on semen analysis, he was found to have normal semen volume, but uh, no sperm. So he was di diagnosed with azospermia. 
And at this point, he was admitted to our ward to have an urgent radical orchiectomy, and we thought we'd better work him up a bit further for azospermia. And I, and I was a little bit stuck because I wasn't sure. I didn't have a really good approach, so I thought I would just review that quickly here. Um, so azospermia is defined as the absence of sperm in the ejaculate. And by definition, you need two samples. And we break this down by, in terms of its etiology, either pre-testicular causes, testicular, or post-testicular. And this is different from aspermia, which is where there's complete absence of the seminal fluid and a completely set, different set of etiologies. Um, it can be caused by problems with the bladder, neck, or prostate, such as retrograde ejaculation or failure of emission due to, say, a prostatic cyst. In this picture, this is a picture of a TUR of a prostate cyst, which would be used to unblock the ejaculatory ducts and treat aspermia. But our patient had azospermia, and it's broken down according to the cause. Pretesticular causes include problems with the pituitary, and it can be congenital or acquired, and this helps guide uh, the history. Common syndrome is associated with anosomia, midline somatic defects. Pituitary disease could be a tumor or an infarct to the pituitary. Testicular causes include uh, sex chromosomal problems, such as Klein's ulcers or Y microdeletions or toxins such as radiation, chemotherapy, uh, mumps or viral orchitis, varicoceles and endosome testis. Post-testicular causes include um, mutations in the cystic fibrosis gene causing congenital bilateral absence of the bag. Young syndrome, which was thought to be associated with cystic fibrosis, is also produces azospermia and uh, chronic lung infections, but they haven't found any of the same gene mutations as you would in cystic fibrosis with this syndrome, but it does appear to be genetic in origin. And this is a, a karyotype of someone who has azospermia. And you can see in the bottom corner, there are four X's and one Y. So this is a Klein-Felters patient with a 49 XXXXY <laughs> chromosome. So just to review the workup of azospermia, our patient had come to our ward and, and, and we knew he had azospermia and we weren't really sure what was causing it. Pre it's, it's very simple, actually, when I read up on this. Basically, if you examine the testis and examine the hormones, it really guides whether or not this is pre-testicular, testicular, or post-testicular. In pre-testicular causes, the testis are small and soft. They have low gonadotropin. And you may suspect a pituitary tumor based on history, and it kind of guides you to image the head. But that's a really rare cause of azospermia. So we're going to focus on testicular failure and possibly post-testicular failure uh, or obstruction as a cause in our patient. In testicular failure, the test is a small and firm as in Klein-Felter syndrome, and they have a high FS FSH and low testosterone. And they would get a karyotype which may show an abnormality, or another option is to get a Y microdeletion uh, fish analysis. Now, we don't do those in Vancouver. It doesn't exist here. Um, but if a patient really wants to have this analyzed, they can have uh, a blood sample sent to Toronto where they'll be analyzed for Y microdeletions. And the reason that is not so important is if this patient goes on to have in vitro fertilization with ICSI, their uh, um, uh, children will not be affected by this abnormality unless they're a male child, they'll also have infertility, but otherwise it does not cause any other abnormality. And post-testicular causes, the testes are normal. They have a normal hormone panel. Um, and you would also examine them to see if they have a vast deference to see if they ha are at risk for cystic fibrosis mutations. And I'm not sure if we do this, but it seems reasonable for someone with basal sternia to also send off a genetic al analysis for cystic fibrosis mutations. Um, patients with cystic fibrosis mutations may also have obstruction of their epididymis and valve. They don't necessarily have to have absence. About 2 to 6 percent of patients with obstructive basal spermia will have a mutation in a cystic fibrosis gene. And so if they have a positive mutation, you would think of sending off their partner's genetics for analysis and, and counsel them appropriately before having ICSI. So in non-obstructive azospermia, when they go on to biopsy, um, most all azospermic patients usually go on to biopsy, and in non-obstructive azospermia, they may have a pattern of Sertoli only syndrome or maturation arrest. And in post testicular um, azospermia, they would have a pattern of, of normal spermatogenesis and perhaps some dilatation of the seminal uh, of, of the um, tubules. 
And just to quickly review the treatment options in non-obstructive azospermia, when they go on for biopsy, um, they may only have about zero to six sperm per cubule. But there are, nowadays, with the ability to perform ICSI with one sperm, if they go on to testicular sperm extraction, about 40 to 60 percent of patients with non-obstructive azospermia will have sperm extracted. And with this technique, once the embryo is implanted into the female, about a third of those embryos will go on to a uh, pregnancy. Um, now, a newer technique which has come around to help with better sperm retrieval techniques in patients with non azospermia is to use a microscope and a microdissection during the test phase procedure. And this improves the sperm retrieval rate. And another new um, technique has been to isolate spermatids or secondary spermatids and inject these into the ova. And they have a, a couple of series in the literature showing that there's a pregnancy rate of about 15% per embryo uh, using this technique. Obstructive azospermia can produce um, many sperm per tubule as there is normal spermatogenesis. And these patients go on to scrotal exploration and a reconstructive procedure. At the time of scrotal exploration, they can have sperm isolated and frozen for possible HD. So back to our patient. He was admitted. We re-examined him. He had a normal right testis, um, and he had a normal palpable valve bilaterally. His hormone pan panel was uh, normal. So this was suggestive clinically of a obstructive azospermia in a guy with undefended testis and testis cancer. <laughs> Um, we didn't measure that, but he had a, because he had a normal semen, um, semen volume, we assumed that his seminal vesicles were, were, were there um, and that he didn't have an adaptatory obstruction. That's obstruction. He, that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, button do I have? Uh, yeah, he did, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure how high they, they were to begin with. But. What about injury to the human injury? I don't know how to get the injury. I have one interesting series I'll show you. It's the only series that I, I, that I wanted to review. But um, our patients had a, a low-risk seminoma and no metastases on, on, on imaging. So he, he's gone on to surveillance um, of his seminoma um, and with presumed uh, obstructive azospermia. And I was trying to figure out what was causing this in this patient and thought maybe it had to do with his bilateral cryptorchidism or, or bilateral orchidopathy, possibly from his testicular cancer. So I, I looked that up. And the other thing to think about is the cystic fibrosis gene and some with the such as spermia, uh, azospermia, but because he has other good reasons, I didn't think that we would necessarily screen for that in this patient. So this is the series I wanted to review, and um, uh, this came out in 2003, and what they did was they had performed testicular sperm extraction in, a, in over 100 patients with presumed non obstructive azospermia for, for many reasons. Either the FSH was slightly elevated, they had small testicles, and they had reason to have obstructive azospermia. And 30 of these patients had a history of bilateral or, uh, orchiopexy for cryptorchidism. And of the patients who ha had other causes, only 9% of these patients had spermatogenesis on testis biopsy. And 40% of these patients, they were able to extract some sperm for freezing, and that's within the normal range of, of this population. But the patients with a history of bilateral orchiopexy, 40% had normal spermatogenesis on testis biopsy. And 77% of these patients were able to have sperm extracted and frozen. And they suggested that perhaps there's some sort of congenital or acquired vasor epididymal obstruction that, that is associated with either the procedure or cryptorchidism itself when it's bilateral. So I thought that was a pretty interesting series because I was surprised. I just assumed undescended tests bilaterally were associated with spermatogenic failure. Um, they didn't really say that there was slightly that they were they, their azospermia and um, clinical picture were suggestive of non obstructive causes. It was either slightly elevated or they didn't really clarify um, exactly. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Non-structural 
or potentially you, if you have, uh, I'm not sure exactly where the inhibition level comes in, but if it's maturation arrest, at least maturation arrest, they may have right. normal, normal hormone levels. Well, that's the point. And then the other point is with testicular cancer. Is this causing the obstructive azospermia? Well, that's unlikely. Patients with testicular failure and, uh, or sorry, um, with uh, somatogenic failure associated with testis cancer, although it's common, um, they often have a higher FSH. And after orchiectomy um, on surveillance, many of these patients go on to have children. And there's one case report in the series of a, of a guy who has obstructive azospermia from a seminoma in a solitary functioning testis. So, I don't think that's the cause. Now, I don't, I'm not sure what this has chosen the next step for this guy. He's had his test of I think he'll probably go on to have a test of biopsy um, to prove that he has a stretch of basal sperm on the other side, free sperm, and also rule out CIS, as it is associated with understanding testis and, and contralateral um, can, uh, uh, testis cancer. And then he'll, if he has a stretch of basal sperm, he'll probably go on to a re, re, reconstruction. And then finally, patients who have infertility or have infertility with testis cancer, there are basically three options to improve their fertility potential. They can gain sperm preoperatively. There are a few case reports um, in patients like ours where they actually isolated the sperm during the orchiectomy. And so the testis is removed and on the back table they isolate the sperm and freeze it there, or not freeze it there, but isolate it and put it into an appropriate medium and freeze it. And, and there are some case reports for doing that. And of course, post-treatment, if they do have truly non-obstructive azospermia after chemotherapy or radiation, they can go on to have um, um, testicular.